Hi, we're back with day one of Spring 1, 2020. Up next, we've got a model of technical leadership from Adib Saikali, a co-worker, and I'm excited to hear from him. Take it away, Adib. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of the day in the in the Agile track. Uh, this is a session about a model of technical leadership. There's really only one purpose for this talk today, which is I hope that everyone here walks away with at least one actionable insight about how to improve their technical leadership. Uh, my name is Adeep Saikali. I'm a principal platform architect with the VMware Modern Application Business Unit. Came through the Pivotal acquisition. And for the first time publicly, I'm actually working on a book called Cloud Native application security. Uh, so I'm pretty hardcore techie. And uh, this talk is actually one of the oldest talks I've ever put together. It's, it's from 2007. And uh, I've, I've lived a lot of what I'm about to tell you. So hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy it. You know, if we start looking at our uh, applications that we build, uh, we usually find that our apps and our projects suffer from four typical problems. I'm sure you've been on projects where it's been there have been delays or budget overruns or unhappy users and, and project cancellations. And the reality is, as an industry, we've mostly focused a lot of our efforts on two broad categories. We've improved our processes tremendously over the years, and we've also had a huge new tools come to uh, come to fruition. And you know, the reality of it with these two. You know, improving our tools and our process is super important. It is required, but in my mind, it's not sufficient. It's important to talk about this idea of what can we do as individuals on these different projects to improve our technical leadership, which kind of begs the question, what does it mean to be a technical leader? Well, here's a really simple definition. We know what a technologist is. It's us. It's the people that are in the tech industry. But what is the definition of a leader? Uh, and if a technical leader is a technologist who has leadership skills, then uh, let's maybe start by looking at what the bestseller lists have to say, you know, like these books that are sitting on the New York Times bestseller list and other things. So if you look at a, at a book like this one, it's on the New York bestseller, bestseller list, it says, do what the military does. Um, this other book says, focus on people's strength and your own strength. While this one says, pay attention to the words that you're using, because you're going to improve your, your execution if you do that. Uh, While well, this particular book will be like, here are the 21 qualities that every leader should strive to, to develop. And this particular one here is, uh, is very famous. It's on the sixth edition uh, and it's sold millions of copies, been around for a long time and it's got like five things you're supposed to do. These books have all inspired me, to be honest with you, but I always felt like, okay, but what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to know that I'm doing those things? Uh, and that's where this kind of conversation started. So I want to start with a bit of a thought experiment, which is, uh, let's say your car breaks down and you open up the hood and then you look. And then do you see the same things that a mechanic would see? So my dad is a mechanic and I know for a fact, like I look, I see an engine but I don't quite see what he sees. Or maybe uh, you're thinking about like you're sitting there, you're coding, uh, a friend of yours walks up and looks at your screen and sees the same code that you're looking at. Do they see the same thing? And so if, you, if we think about this, really what I'm trying to get at is, do we see the world through our eyes or do we see the world through the, wor through the words, through the concepts that we have? And, and, and this, is, this is important. I, 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 I make the claim that if you don't understand the concepts and the words, you won't see the, what's there. Uh, so my dad is going to see all the different parts in the car engine and how they're related to each other and why, you know, how this particular one sounds. It tells you that what's wrong with it and that kind of stuff. And I wouldn't. It'll just be, I see an engine. Um, and, and that's really gets to me at the heart of what a leader is. And, and that is... Leaders seem to be able to figure out a path forward when everybody else can't. Or maybe you're sitting there and as a collectively as a group, we can think of three things that we could do to achieve an objective. And a leader may be able to come up with a fourth option or, or a fifth option. And, and so this idea of we act based on how we interpret the world is you know, kind of a pretty common idea. I think a lot of people have, have heard about that. And that raises the question, if we're looking at the world when we look at a software project, what are the lenses that we can use to look at this software project? So uh, we can look at the world through uh, an economic perspective for a software project. How much money is this application going to make us? 
how much money is this application going to save us? What new business opportunities is this going to generate? We can look at things from a management perspective, such as uh, when is this uh, pro application need to go live? How much? Uh, how many folks do we have working on it? Uh, who's going on vacation when? Uh, how mission? Where's the critical path for this particular project? Uh, who are the stakeholders that need to be satisfied? We can be looking at this from a technical perspective, such as boy, what kind of database are we going to store our data in? What programming language will we be using? What platform will be de we deploying it on? And, and these are all valuable perspectives. And what I've observed on all the projects that I've been on is there that these three roles tend to be held by three different people. And because of that, you, you run into this situation where one of these uh, three perspectives takes priority in decision making. So I've been on teams where uh, technical uh, concerns were the number one priority and the decisions that were made optimized technical concerns, but it wasn't the best overall decision uh, because it, it prioritized technology too much. I've been on other projects where economics and the costs and the, and the revenue was the number one priority and that led to suboptimal decisions because it didn't factor the other two factors in. Similarly, I've been on projects where it was just about the deadlines, just about the project management, and that also didn't lead to globally good decisions. Uh, so uh, my definition of a technical leader and what the model that we're using for the talk today is one where a technical leader is somebody who's able to take those three perspectives into their decision-making process. And in order to make a decision, you need to be able to see the world simultaneously from those three perspectives. And so let's kind of ask a question then. Okay, so how do we look at the world? Well, we said you look at it through words, but is there a better definition? Yes, there is. It, there's this famous word paradigm. And, you know, a paradigm is a, if you look at the dictionary definition, it says it's a set of assumptions, concepts, values, and uh, practices that constitute a way of viewing reality for the community that shares them, especially in an intellectual discipline, which is what we work in. Uh, and so if we look at it like that, what's a simpler way of, of saying a paradigm? Well, is effectively the box. You know, when we talk about the, uh, the box within which you analyze problems, you're given a problem and you're like, how can I break this down and, 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 and using the tool set that I know? Um, and so what's interesting is to look at some of the properties of paradigms and how they affect our thinking. Because if, if we can understand that, we can actually uh, break out of it and do the outside of the box thinking, which is typically associated with leadership. Uh, so what we want to look at is that step one, we need to recognize what paradigm we're in. And step two, we need to learn some new paradigms potentially, or hopefully uh, be lucky enough to be involved in creating perhaps a, a new paradigm. And, and for that, let's look at a couple of more aspects of paradigms. One is that if you're inside of a paradigm, um, what's obvious in one paradigm can be like really not obvious in another one. So let's think of an example. If you're a software developer, uh, you may have uh, heard of the functional programming paradigm and the imperative programming paradigm. And in the imperative programming paradigm, it's okay to have side effects. I have variables, I can change their values. In the functional paradigm, hmm, I don't do that. Everything is immutable. I don't have any side effects. And the net of it is that uh, you know, uh, something that is a best practice in one paradigm, changing the state of a variable is a no-no in another one. Uh, another effect of it is that um, concurrency is super easy in uh, the functional paradigm and not so easy in the imperative paradigm. So what's, what's possible in one paradigm can be like really, really difficult in the other one. And you look at technology trends, things like containers, uh, Kubernetes, uh, NoSQL, um, all of these are kind of paradigms that are emerging uh, that are, are, are kind of like saying something that's really hard to do today is going to be easier to do with that. So in the world of management, DevOps is like a different paradigm for how you do, how you do things. Um, so as an example that this isn't new, like, uh, but sometimes it can take thousands of years for new paradigms to emerge. So for example, uh, in mathematics, it took only 2,126 years for uh, non-Euclidean geometry to emerge. And in that one, this is this crazy thing where parallel lines do meet and it actually has real world applications. Um, and what I'm trying to get at here is that if we buy into this idea of, of paradigms or how we perceive the world, then when you change a paradigm, you run into like your own issues, which is all of your experience with the old paradigm means nothing. You have to go back to a beginner mindset. 
and all, all of your you know, best practices in one paradigm may not carry over into uh, the new paradigm, which causes us to fall into the trap of the right paradigm, where we, we, we find as human beings, change is hard, and we, 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 we want to hold on to that paradigm that, that we really know and love, and it's easy for us to ignore the, the emerging stuff and say, ah, I don't need that, that doesn't apply, and all that kind of stuff. And, and this leads me to kind of a, a key concept of this talk, which is that there's two ways you can, you can work with paradigms. You can work inside of a paradigm, which means like, let's say you're a Java developer and you're like, hey, I can write Java code. I can write classes and interfaces um, and, uh, and that's how I want to see the world. Uh, or you can say, you know what, that is actually bounded with the object-oriented programming paradigm and these are all the downsides of the object-oriented paradigm and these are all the good things about it. And, and that's what I would call working with, when you're conscious of how the paradigm you're working in is actually affecting things. So to kind of make this a little bit more concrete, uh, let's take a look at what a technical leadership journey can look like. If you're working in IT today, for the most part, people tend to fall into, you know what, go down the technology track and work with the actual, you know, coding and, and system administration and all that stuff. Or you jump onto the management track and you learn how to be uh, a people manager and managing the process that's, that's being used. Or perhaps you take on a sales, finance, economics kind of path. And, and, and people kind of like, that's all they do. They stay within their track. And then you learn how to make really good decisions within your track. And then you become certified in that. And you may even get degrees in those, in those areas. And what I'm proposing is that we say, okay, let's take a step back. Why can't we do all, all three? Why can't, me, why can't I, as a technologist, take a career path that actually exposes me to the management paradigms and I get good at using those paradigms and understanding their limitations? Or I similarly with the economic paradigms and the finance paradigms. And so to kind of like make it concrete, let's look at the evolution of somebody who's just like, look, I just learned how to program, I'm now a developer, all the way to I've developed my skill set as a technical leader, and hopefully you'll be able to see some opportunities for yourself to, uh, to like, you know, uh, develop your skills and, and get an actionable insight, which is really the goal of the presentation today. So as developer, you start out and you're like, great, I'm going to learn a programming language. If you don't know a programming language, at least one programming language, you can't be a developer. And for the most part, when you start that process, you're like, hey, I want to learn the next programming language. I want to learn a tool. I want to learn how to use a database. And you spend a lot of time writing code and you're learning products. That's basically what you do. You learn products and you say, I know Java. I know C Sharp. I know JavaScript. Um, and then something changes. Eventually, you realize that there are patterns behind what you're learning, and you start basically saying, I'm a functional uh, developer, I'm an object-oriented developer, or I'm a full-stack developer, or something along those lines. Because now you're able to think in terms of the patterns that underlying the technology. You're like, I don't care how I write. Uh, if I write a class in Java or C Sharp, or if I write a function in, in whatever, in F Sharp or, or Haskell or, or Java, uh, it's going to be like you understand what it means. You can begin to use those paradigms. And, and that's like a huge mental shift. Like that's the first big one that occurs. And this is where I would say developers graduate to being designers, not in the sense of graphic designer, but in the sense of like you have an opinion about how the code should be structured and how you would, you know, you would implement things. And that's the focus on, 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 on paradigm, uh, on paradigms. And um, so that's that. So my kind of first invitation to you is to think about um, what technical paradigms do you currently work in, where you feel like, hey, I'm really competent at working with this paradigm. And are you working in them or are you working with them? Do you understand their limitations? Uh, so normally, this presentation is actually not 25 minutes. It's actually normally 90 minutes. And it has a whole bunch of breaks and a, and a form where people kind of write down their answers to these questions. The common feedback I've got is, hey, I got some insights into what I want to do with my career next. So uh, I'm condensing it all quickly into 25 minutes. Um, so think about those questions after the talk. Um, so that takes us to the next step, which is like, OK, I'm a developer. I've learned the paradigms behind a bunch of the technologies I use. And you get into this natural state where you can work and understand a whole application. This is where I would 
call that person an application architect. In that application, there's going to be multiple paradigms. And traditionally, where paradigms meet is where uh, there are um, uh, issues, performance issues, like where the database meets the Java code, uh, you get into performance issues, or where uh, finance meets like the way you run the project. And you're like, hey, I'm going to do agile, but we're going to do a funding model where the funding model is all waterfall uh, based. So at the level of application architect, it's not enough to just do technology. You now have to be able to work inside of some of the non-technical paradigms because you have to plan your application. You have to uh, you know, run a software development process and that kind of stuff. So when we take a step back and we look at like what what are those uh, uh, you know, uh, categories of paradigms? This is technology management and economic. In the, in the technical uh, paradigms, we may do things like, uh, you know, like object-oriented, functional, reactive, relational databases, uh, containers, uh, control theory, and all that type of stuff. And in the, in the management ones, we'll have things like agile, waterfall, things like how do we hire people? How should we interview them? Should we like, for example, give people a take-home assignment to do as, with programming, or should we not? Should we ask people to, uh, should we evaluate people to see if they are a cultural fit to our organization? Or is that actually biasing us and, and like making, making us pass on really good candidates? Uh, things like how do you manage your team? Uh, do you tell your team what to do or do you listen to your team? So there are a lot of paradigms out there within management. And what I'm here to tell you is you don't want to be blind to the paradigm you're in. There isn't a right one. There is the right paradigm for the job that you're, you're, you're trying to accomplish. And if you get conscious of those paradigms, you get the freedom to choose the right tool for the job. And, um, and, and so if we kind of continue with this evolution of looking at like, okay, somebody grows up and becomes an application architect from having graduated from being a developer to a designer. And what's really happened here is that they, they've turned into uh, appreciating the power of paradigms and how it affects their thinking. And they've become something called a, what I would call a, called a generalizing specialist. Uh, and a generalizing specialist is kind of an interesting term. It was, it was coined by Scott Ambler years ago. And it basically, based on the observation that if you have a team of completely 100% specialists, they can't get anything done because they can't talk to each other. Because all they do is they know just how to think in terms of their specialty. They're the world's best experts on whatever it is they're doing. And they insist that things have to be done according to the best practices of their specialty. Uh, if you have a team of generalists, well, you don't have enough depth on the team for them to actually deliver whatever it is you're trying to do. And if you have a team of generalizing specialists, i.e. folks who are, uh, let's call them jack of all trades, master of a few, what ends up happening is you end up with a, uh, the ability to go deep on things and go broad. And that's like one of the things that's missing. A lot of the time when I'm talking to developers, um, they're all about, or, or techies, they're all about just learning the next technology. And then I talk to the uh, CIOs and the finance people, and they're just about the money or the project management aspect. And they're like really not interested in the technology at all. And, and this is something we can, we can truly as individuals affect in, in our industry, kind of get to that, that, that next stage. And this really, if you look at things from this point, it has one advantage, which is it solves this dilemma that we have in technology, which is that everything we learn becomes obsolete really, really quickly. And again, Scott Ambler had a really great uh, uh, kind of classification for this. He looked at skills and he said, look, if you're, you know, there's a bunch of product and platform skills and they're good for five to 10 years. Imagine you started learning Kubernetes five years ago. Today, you're going to be massively in demand because not a lot of people know Kubernetes and, and enterprises are adopting them. Or perhaps you'll learn how to do iPhone development right when the iPhone came out. And then you could make a business and, and, and add a lot of value to uh, because you're one of the few people that knew that. But in about 10 years, once a technology or a platform is out, uh, everybody's going to know it. There's going to be, it's not a competitive advantage to you at all as an individual. Uh, paradigm skills tend to last longer. They, they, they last for 15, 20, 30 years. Like think of like the SQL paradigm. It's still around, it's still useful. And so if you, if you focus on learning the paradigms, you get longevity from what you know. And if you step beyond the technical paradigms into like communication, collaboration skills and management and finance, now you're starting to deal with human nature. 
And when you're dealing with human nature, luckily humans don't change that fast. So your skills at interviewing people, giving feedback, or uh, you know, motivating people, uh, helping facilitate sessions, those are all going to be uh, things that are good for the rest of your career. So my kind of um, thought to everybody here that's attending and listening today is think about what are the skills that you would say, are you a specialist in those today? And what are the skills that you're a generalist in? And ask yourself, okay, if I want to become a generalizing specialist, what new specialties do I need to develop? And what new general things do I need to develop? And, and so uh, that those questions hopefully will give you insights into what to do to become a better technical leader. And so, okay, great. Now you're like, I got it. I can do not only can I write code, I can also think in terms of the paradigms and the patterns, and I, can, I know enough paradigms that I can get a single application out. But the world is more complicated than that because we tend to build systems of systems. Um, you know, your, your, your banking application talks to, has a UI, a mobile app, which talks to a service, which talks to another service, which eventually hits the mainframe, which does something, which does something, which does something else. So the a system architect is where you get into a position where you have a portfolio of, of applications you have to manage. It's no longer enough to just know how to run the software development process. Now you have to, you're, the most important decisions you're going to make are going to be about how the team is working together about who you put in charge of different things. And, and you need to really get comfortable with, don't be, don't be blind to the management paradigm you're working in. This is also where you have a budget and you have to figure out how to, uh, to make a profit or loss on the system of systems that you're part of. And, and so that's really, for me, like kind of starting to get into like, okay, I don't need to be an expert in discount cash flow and, and finance. But I need, to, I need to be able to, to read those things. I need to be able to understand those things. And, and that takes us to kind of like, you know, at maturity, uh, as a technical leader, you, you, you are able to do all the things that a system architect would do. And you are able to think in terms of, uh, you know, the technical paradigms you're working in, the management paradigms you're working in, and the economic business paradigms. This is where you start looking at things and saying, okay, the business model that we're trying to accomplish as an organization is X. Here's how the technology that we're building is supporting that business model. And you start bringing those into the conversations that you're having with your team. And you start uh, showing everybody in your, in your team from the developer to the designer, to the application architect, to, to your colleagues that are also technical leaders and also the non-technical folks that we, like, how is it that we're moving towards this goal? Um, and so I would say that at this stage, you should be equally as home with a bunch of MBAs talking about like finance and discount cash flow analysis as you are sitting with a developer arguing over the design of, uh, uh, of some code. Um, you know, for me personally, what that journey looked like once I kind of got my head around like these different layers is I went and I bought all my friends' books that were doing MBAs and I took their books and I did all, read all the books and did all the problems in the back of the book <laughs> until I felt like I understood those things. And it took me about five years, like honestly, to, to learn a lot of the stuff. But this really gives you as uh, the in our industry, the, the ability to really listen to people and look at things from these three perspectives of, of, of the uh, management paradigm, uh, the par management paradigms, the technical paradigms, and the economic paradigms. And if you can see the world from all those three perspectives, you can bring an incredibly valuable insights to any project or organization you're working with uh, and, and kind of like uh, generate more uh, possibilities for action. Just, hey, here's something we could be doing that, that nobody else thought about. And it also puts you in a place where uh, you can more easily talk to the individual experts in these. I'm not suggesting that you become like the world's number one guru on all these three different areas. You are going to be a generalizing specialist, but you'll be able to speak the language of everyone uh, uh, in these areas. So I hope that today was uh, was useful for you. And I hope that you got something to think about, about what you can do for your, uh, for your career uh, to become a better technical leader. Thank you very much.
All right, well, that wraps up our final day of the Agile Leadership Track. Up next is the main stage. So switch over to that one and we will see you tomorrow for the Agile Leadership Track.